Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my presentation for the third online international meeting for Open Phone users. I would like to start off by thanking Joseph for once again organising this event and for all the wonderful content on Open Phone that he puts out onto the internet. And without further ado, let's get into the presentation. I will be presenting the analysis of the spa splash lubrication of a gearbox, taking a simple example, the use of multi-phase modelling in open foam will be evaluated, uh, some of the issues I faced will be explored and the results will be compared with a commercial moving particle simulation tool. So some of the motivation um, for this research Inadequate lubrication is one of the most common sources of failure in rotating components. It can cause uh, higher contact damage due to pitting on the faces of gear teeth, overheating of bearings and generally louder operation. A common experimental method is to build a, a duplicate of your system with a transparent case to visualize the flow and dispersion of lubricant. However, this isn't always practical, especially with small or complex geometry. More recently, the moving particle simulation approach has been used to handle these kind of simulations. It's very fast and generally easier than MEST approaches and is good for flow visualization, but does a poor job of approximating uh, losses um, because the boundary layer is not resolved um, in this approach. Uh, there have been lots of advances in MESHed methods recently, particularly with the overset or chimera grids. Um, but there's very limited literature on open source solutions using these methods. So let's move into the theory uh, for these simulations. Uh, it's uh, an incompressible solution, so we solve the incompressible forms of the continuity and momentum equations. The case is transient and also turbulent. It's multi-phase, um, this means we introduce an alpha field where alpha equals one is the oil and alpha equals zero is the air. And this comes with its own transport equation. The problem is also isothermal. So the energy equation will not be solved during this modeling. The mesh, ah, the geometry, sorry. Um, there's a, a simple helical gear um, inside a, a slightly larger rotating zone um, there's a simple case about 20 centimeters um, with the gear being about five centimeters and a, a pressure outlet which is uh, important as we're solving an incompressible problem. Now for the mesh. Um, the sliding mesh approach is being used so you can see the sliding interface between the mesh sorry that's generated for um, the gear um, and that of the background mesh. The background mesh is reasonably coarse, it's just generated simply using block mesh. And then snappy hex mesh, mesh is used um, with some reasonably low refinement levels um, and no specific refinement regions because all of this work is done on my personal computer, which is just a quad core machine. Um, a much finer mesh and a much better mesh has been generated, um, but it's uh, not viable for me to run that at the minute. So meshing um, generally is the most important part of any CFD problem. As the saying goes, who owns the mesh owns the solution. So naturally check mesh is one of my most commonly run commands. You can see the result here for the coarse mesh, coarse mesh is reasonably satisfactory. Um, most of the checks are passed and the level of skewness here should be um, should be acceptable for um, for the simulation that we're running. So the setup um, finish time is set just in case it did ever run for that long um, approximately two full rotations. A small initial time step um, that we're going to get to in a few slides time and writing out approximately every one hundredth of a full rotation. Um, and the max current number um, set to 0.5, um, just to try and add some stability to the problem. Flow properties are typical for gearbox oil. Um, I put the divergent schemes used up here 
um, but a bit later in the presentation we're going to um, consider how they could be changed to add stability um, but I was just going for something um, pretty stable so the reason everyone is interested in CFD all of the pretty pictures so I'm going to play these, play these uh, through first just to give you an idea of uh, the simulations that I've been doing. You'll notice the simulation stops at around 0.03 seconds um, and that happens because the time step suddenly becomes very small. So what we're going to do in the next few slides is delve into some of the problems that were faced uh, during, uh, during these simulations. So looking at the current number um, as it progresses with time, current number obviously being the ratio of the real velocity to the numerical velocity and as we said we're set to about 0.5 so the real velocity and we're expecting somewhere around 5 meters per second max which comes from the 1000 rpm rotational speed and the 5 centimeter gear radius the range of delta x comes from check mesh and this gives a delta t of about 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 6, which is why um, it was set to 10 to the minus 5, somewhere in the middle, um, for the start of the simulation. So variable time step is used in the simulation. Um, time step that's dependent on the current number, which we just saw looks pretty good over the course of the simulation. Delta x doesn't change, but as the simulation progresses, the time step suddenly becomes very, very small. The simulation never actually stops or diverges, but with a time step of 10 to the minus 10 or minus 11, it's not really going anywhere either. So looking at our equation for the current number, it seems that the only explanation is that somewhere in the simulation is a region of very high velocity. So I looked at this extensively in Paraview um, with lots of different uh, visualization and I see max velocities of around 10 meters per second, perhaps a little higher than expected, but nothing extreme. Um, so it seems at the minute that there isn't really an explanation for this, this sudden reduction in time step that's stopping the simulation. So I've taken a, a, a couple of approaches to try and figure this out. The first of which is to run the same simulation with a much slower rotational velocity, about 50 RPM. So same mesh, same simulation setup. Um, the real time is a lot longer. Um, so it, it, it runs for more time, but the RPM is lower. So in terms of gear rotations, um, there's actually uh, less simulation before the time step suddenly reduces um, in the same manner as you can see here. Um, the time step does remain higher for most of the simulation. Um, so the actual total computational time is a fair bit less. Now we saw with the 1000 RPM case, one side of the oil fill lowers and one increases due to the helical nature of the gear. And this seems to be very much accentuated at the 50 RPM. As we can see here, um, one side of the oil fill um, comes all the way up to the top of the case. It would be very interesting to see how this feature evolves with more time, and that's definitely something I will explore once the stability of the simulation is fixed. It does look a little bit odd, however. So to further check the validity of the simulation, as well as to get some more insight into the stability problem, I simplified the setup even further to just consider a spur gear um, where the fill level should remain largely the same across the width of the uh, bounding box. So I'll start off with a couple of videos once again with the simple spur gear and this is back to the original rotational speed of 1000 rpm. And on the right. Something you'll see later when we compare the simulation with the particle based approach is that the oil uh, does seem to be a little more dispersed than with the uh, helical gear solution, but um, these results look pretty good 
which does suggest the case setup is reasonably realistic. So in terms of solution validity, that's good. Um, but what about stability? Well, once again, looking at the current number and the time step, um, unfortunately, I didn't have time to continue uh, running this until we saw uh, any kind of reduction in time step, but the simulation is definitely stable up to the same kind of order as the helical gear variant. Um, this dip you can see at the end in the time step, uh, it's just a spike that the time step does return back to its uh, back to its normal level. But the presence of the spike alone does suggest some area of high velocity. Um, but once again, I was uh, unable to see anything in the visualization in Paraview. So the last thing I tried is uh, changing some of the settings in the FE schemes. I did manage to get some improvement of instability going from the schemes you can see up on the left to those down on the right. Um, I managed to get about 50% more runtime with the original case, um, but still nothing I would be happy calling stable and putting my name to. So where does this leave us? A seemingly realistic and seemingly stable simulation with a seemingly acceptable mesh that for each slightly different case sees this sudden reduction in time step. It's not a traditional divergence where the current number explodes, but I'm still none the wiser about why it's happening. So. With that in mind, if anyone has any thoughts or suggestions or wants the case files to play around with, please get in touch or leave a comment on this video um, and we can try to figure it out. So for a little more validation, um, I would expect the flow between the gears to be in some form or another alike to the lid driven cavity problem. So this is um, one of the initial cases using a, a, a helical gear um, and the black arrows are the in-plane velocity vectors and they look pretty good. Um, there's no real discontinuity in the sliding interface um, and the, the vectors are kind of as would be expected. Um, however, one of the more recent simulations that should be a similar setup you can see a clear discontinuity at the sliding interface. Um, so there is definitely some, some other issue with the simulation, but um, if there's a much higher velocity close to the gear, it could be causing um, some of the issues. Perhaps one way of fixing this would be to change the size of the zone around the gear, um, giving more clearance. Uh, between the gear teeth and the sliding interface and that's definitely something I will be um, doing another test for. So moving on to the comparison with the particle braced approach. I'm going to start off with a brief explanation of how the moving particle simulations work and they, that is with the lattice Boltzmann approach. In finite volume the fluid domain is meshed and nodes are assigned to the vertices of the mesh. These nodes don't move and they contain the properties of the fluid at that point in space. In the lattice Boltzmann method, the nodes which contain the fluid properties are assigned to fluid particles that are transported with the flow. It is therefore a meshless approach to CFD. So on the left, we see the particle based approach, and on the right, one of the earlier simulations using interfoam. So I'm going to take you back to a little way through the simulation. Rotation of about one gear tooth out of the fluid. And the two simulations are in pretty good agreement. Um, similar amount of flow on the gear teeth. Even some of these uh, smaller features are present in both simulations. But as we go a little bit further, we see things now start to differ. The fluid in the interfoam solution is not quite as dispersed um, as that in the particle based approach and there's clearly some differences on the face of the gear as well. One thing we do see in both simulations is that the oil fill level um, 
clearly lowers on one side and increases on the other. This uh, trend of differences in the simulation increases when we get to about 0.03 seconds, um, somewhere around half a key rotation, the fluid distribution is now very different. Um, especially the back of the gear where it's entering the fluid, there's a lot more disruption in the particle-based approach. And the dispersion of the fluid on the near side is reasonably different. One thing to note though, the shape of the fluid that's hitting the top of the case is actually reasonably similar. Um, now the contours uh, you can see from the interfoam solution are alpha equals 0.5, um, with alpha being um, the variable that determines where the oil and air interface is. Um, so perhaps visualizing some, um, so some different numbers would give um, would give a result that's slightly closer to the particle-based approach. So to complete the comparison, let's look at some numbers. Um, the largest differences being, of course, in stability and in runtime. With the interfoam solution, um, there was lots of messing around with, uh, with settings, um, with geometries, with meshes, as you saw, to get some kind of vaguely stable solution. But with the particle-based approach, despite having only been introduced to the specific tool used reasonably recently, I was able to set up the simulation from the same SDL files in 15 or 20 minutes, and it just ran to completion. Now, that's not to say that the moving particle simulation method is better than finite volume. Um, these simulations can and often do still diverge. And what you gain in speed, you do lose in fidelity. But for a simple splash, splash lubrication problem, the approach is very good. For runtime, um, the solution to about 0.03 seconds you saw um, with Interfoam running on four quick cores took about a day to get, um, I should say, 0.03 seconds of real time. Uh, the particle-based approach with a one millimeter particle size on the same number of slower cores took only three hours. This could be even quicker though, um, as generally particle-based approaches are optimized to run on GPUs. So for a summary, what have we done? We've used the sliding mesh approach to build a transient multi-phase simulation of the splash, splash lubrication of a single gear in a box. There are clearly some issues that need to be resolved, um, but let's look at what could come next. Obviously, the first thing is to address the robustness of the simulation. This sudden reduction in time step is plaguing the simulations and does need to be resolved. But of, um, as always with CFD, there are a lot more avenues of investigation. We mentioned the larger rotational region that's further away from the gear tooth. There are further simplifications that could be made to the model, maybe reducing the fill level, maybe some other changes to the settings in FD solution. Perhaps the finer mesh would give a more robust simulation. Uh, maybe looking at some different turbulence models, um, maybe playing around with the mesh to adjust the Y plus to make it um, make it fit the turbulence model a little bit better but these will take time to set up and run um, and they are all things that I will be I will be doing um, and maybe this time uh, this time next year you'll you'll see them in another presentation so once these sort of issues have been rectified the problem can then be extended to multiple gears now with the sliding mesh approach that was used for this simulation, overlapping rotation regions isn't possible. So the two main approaches to consider are remeshing and overset grids. Remeshing is a technique where a single mesh is generated for the whole domain and the points are skewed as the gears rotate 
until the quality becomes too poor and then a new mesh for the current rotational position is introduced. The meshes can all be generated before the simulation is run, um, but of course there can be some issues with mapping the results between meshes and with very small gaps between the gear teeth. It is however a reasonably well documented approach. The overset method then, more computationally expensive, but no remeshing is required and the meshes for each gear can be generated and refined independently. However, there is not, as we mentioned earlier, that much literature on the approach using open foam for this kind of problem. So finally, the very long-term goal is to be able to simulate a whole gearbox, including things like maybe jet lubrication and considering heat transfer. Thank you very much for watching and for listening, and thank you once again for Joseph for organising this event.